All right. Good morning, everyone, and thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, it's our first webinar as a company, and uh, we would preferably not have chosen this type of channel due to the circumstances uh, that the whole world faces. Uh, this is probably the best tool that we have at the moment. We've got people logging in from all over the world, from London to Dublin to South Africa to the States. And uh, we really appreciate your time. The idea of today's session is really simple. Um, we have learned a lot of lessons through the last year of few years of implementing systems. We've got a number of different people in our company and our customers who influence the way systems are implemented. Is that they successful or unsuccessful? And the idea of today is really just to share some of the things we've learned. And we decided to make this theme one of our favorite themes, if not our most favorite theme, is systems theory. Now, some of you might have read up on it a little bit. It's an old concept. Uh, people like Peter Drucker and so on have been preaching it for 40, 50 years. And we've learned a lot of lessons out of that. So uh, I'm going to hand over to Tian. Uh, from here, he's going to be doing most of the talking. We we foresee that we'll probably be he'll probably be busy for about 30, 40 minutes. So then we don't want to use up the whole hour. Um, in the questions box, you are more than welcome to post any questions at any point. Which uh, after we're done, we'll run through some of the questions and just allow Tian and whoever needs to answer them as best we can. So Tian, uh, thank you very much for your time. Tian is uh, Tian of you is our Probably like person in our company, he's got an amazing knowledge of systems, thinking around systems. And uh, I hope you enjoy this and uh, we'll chat again. Thank you, Tian. You can go ahead. Thank you, Lord. Now, now, thank you everybody for attending today. I think we we have a, a unique circumstances. We said that, that it's probably the only webinar where nobody's at work. Uh, where most people are probably sitting in pajamas. Um, and I think we're, we're quite lucky that we know literally every person on this call. We've worked closely with some of you, both on the Salesforce side and on the client side. Um, so it's a nice opportunity to just, uh, in between everything else, focus on when everybody starts lifting their heads back up, when the lockdown stops, how do we get back to work, what are the things we focus on. So a very large part of what we do when we do our work is, is based largely on, on something that Einstein said, that he said that if he had a problem to solve, he'd spent almost all of his time thinking about the problem rather than the solution. What we've seen is that accurate diagnosis is, is very much to half the cure. If you are, as a company and as a team, able to uh, have consistent methodologies for understanding the problems we face and our clients face better than the competition, you tend to build better solutions that this is so central that we can't even add a team of effective programmers to program something based on a faulty assumption. And when we start looking at the problems that we face mostly when we do Salesforce implementations, it revolves around three cores, marketing, sales, and service. If you see those three broadly, it covers most of what the company does, whether it be uh, the, the, uh, the entire journey from word to mouth, all of the stuff that goes into sales, all of the activities, the admin activities in sales, and ultimately the, the ability to consistently render the service. But when we look at these, there's often problems um, that, that manifest themselves that we try and understand in this funnel to save problems at the top where you struggle to get enough um, opportunities that flow into your funnel you struggle to convert as many as you need to, or you struggle with visibility. And at the end, you struggle to keep your customers. Now, regardless of which industry this is in, this is true. This is always something all of the industries suffer. Why we focus on systems theory, trying to solve these problems when you try and, and fix them one at a time, when you try and fix them by plugging specific holes, tends to never ever have the effect that you intended to have. And systems theory helps us get to the answer about why that happens. So Russell Ackoff is, uh, is, a, is a pioneer in systems theory, very interesting human being. I would definitely recommend just trying to look at the, the one TED talk that he did do. Um, he died a few years ago. But we look at a few core lessons before we actually dive into how we do blueprinting to apply it. 
we look at a few core lessons that consistently lead us towards a better solution. Now, the very first one is the place where you observe a problem is very rarely where you fix the problem. The example we love to use is if you have a car and you know what the car is supposed to do, it's supposed to go from A to B, but it's not doing that. It's standing still. The wheels aren't turning. Now, you're not going to change the wheels. You know that there's something else wrong, but we see this so much in uh, organizations where they say we have a sales problem or a marketing problem. It must be a marketing problem or it must be a sales problem. Or scenarios where we often see when we work with reps inside companies where they take the foot off the petrol when they need to sell sometimes. And it frustrates you because you don't understand why. And then often when you follow it through, you see that it has almost nothing to do with the problem there. It has something to do outside. That something, for instance, where they're not confident in the delivery ability of the warehouse influences their confidence when they try and approach a specific customer. The second very big uh, thing to understand is how the parts interact define how the system performs. You can never look at a part and from that determine the performance of the system. So if we look at the drivetrain of a car, for example, you have to look at how each part fits into each other part. And generally speaking, what that means is if you focus only on the parts, you're going to struggle to get the performance of the system to improve. If I look at this system there and I spend an extra 1 million rand improving the steering wheel without improving the parts around it, it's not going to have one piece of effect on the rest of the system. So when we look at the company and all the companies we work with as systems, where we start seeing the, the improvement opportunities has a lot to do with how we see those interact with, with one another. An example we like to use is when we add a specific type of tech, that, uh, that spans different parts of the business. It allows us to uh, find ways of, of making the systemic effect on the entire system a bit more. A third crucial part is the concept of fit. Uh, the example Russell Ackoff uses is to say that if we look at the example of a car again and we get all of the world's engineers together and so we say we're going to make the perfect car, we want you to make a list of the best engine that exists, the best chassis, the best. Uh, transmission, and we get uh, a, a vote between all of them on which are the best ones, and they choose the engine from the Mercedes, the chassis from the BMW, and after all of that, they have theoretically the best potential car, except there's one problem. None of those parts fit. How those parts fit together determines how that system ultimately operates. And for us, this is so key because this is one of the first parts where you have to start thinking about culture as well. Cultural fit is a key determinant on whether the solution is ultimately going to be successful or not. Another key principle is when you start adding different parts, you don't look at them separately. The example we like to use is in chess, again, if you play with just a rook or if you play with just a knight, you play very differently than when you play with the two together. Similarly, when we have certain building blocks in the system, and we can, we, we're going to get to the part where we talk about the Salesforce building blocks, the external building blocks, our integration plans, whenever you add an extra element, you have to be able to map what the effect on the whole is going to be for adding that element. Another key thing we try and understand as well is the difference between solving a problem and dissolving a problem. So often what we do is, is if the example ACOP uses again, is we have uh, we switch the TV on and we asked, what is the chance that the channel that you're on will be something you like? And he says, probably 1%. Now, that's very easy to change. You just change the channel. But they admit, that means there's a 50% chance that the next channel will be even worse. So you can't necessarily solve something by trying to just solve that. Whereas dissolving the problem tries to look at the problem as a whole and tries to say, how can we remove the existence of this problem as a whole? And it's impossible to do that until you really have a full, full understanding of what happens inside that company. Another very key concept, again, in systems theory is what the difference in speed does. So the example we use, again, is if, if you drive your car and you're used to how your car responds, you know it so well, you understand if you turn, how much it's going to turn. The only variable we change is we add a delay. So we say after you turn your steering wheel, it will take about five seconds before the car responds. Would you be able to drive that car? And the ultimate answer is no, you can't drive it around the block. Your ability to respond rapidly to requirements 
changes the game. When we walk into development cycles that are too slow to roll out of the initial idea, we see that the ideas dry up, that the entire focus we have has been on understanding the systems well enough so that we can foresee what type of work you need to do, so that you can foresee how you can deliver on this quickly. Another crucial one is, is, is again, the concept of crucial episodes, that not everything in the chain of events is equally important. With the example we use is, is again in a restaurant where we say how long are you willing to wait in a restaurant depends entirely on where you are at that stage if you're in front of the door you have about five to ten seconds before somebody has to help you before you get irritated after you sit down it becomes two minutes before somebody has to bring a menu before you're irritated after you ordered it becomes 10 minutes so trying to create a system that responds equally fast across the entire chain is an impossible game and a flawed game. So we try and identify as we try and understand the business where it makes a bigger difference for us to be able to respond faster and where can we afford to buy a little time. Now why this is so important, especially in systems theory, is the Salesforce ecosystem has evolved massively from its uh, initial finding in 99 to now. Every single one of these products that have been added to the freight changes the the way that every other piece of it works. If we, for instance, add something like Marketing Cloud, we suddenly have the ability to influence the leads coming into the system, which means that you do it differently. But equally for Marketing Cloud, you're able to push back information from your CRM, key insights the whole time. The same with your MuleSoft products and Datarama. Every piece that's added adds to the complexity of the whole. Now, when we start looking at a Salesforce stack, because that's ultimately why, why we try and work so closely with the uh, with the salespeople from Salesforce themselves is to a large degree they are the enablers for us to get the system in front of clients that we we play a very large game in trying to get the right mix of products that will be able to make the biggest effect for a client. What we ultimately say is you can't take part of a solution and intend to get the whole result. I can't take ninety percent of a car. I have 90%, I'm just going to take out the carburetor and uh, the fuel tech. It's still 90% of a car, but it's not going to go 90% of the speed. It's not going anywhere. So there's a crucial set of software that's necessary within your chain in order for this to operate at its best. So often when you leave just one core part out, out, the effect on the whole is massive. So what we do, if we talk about our methodology for how we get to this answer using systems theory, we have about a five-step process that we do in the development cycle. The very first one is a servicecape blueprint of your current landscape. The servicecape blueprint is intended to enable our team to understand as well as possible what's happening inside that system. And often it helps the client also understand what happens within their system as a, as a company. Uh, in ways that they might not have seen before. But the problem often is that software is notoriously difficult to map. If uh, if I look at a certain object, the, the, the angle I look at the object changes, but it doesn't change the object itself. But when it comes to software, the angle we use to look at it completely changes the thing that you look at. So for those who understand, for instance, an ERD, an Entity Relationship Diagram, it it's a specific view that allows you to see the objects, but it doesn't show you the user behavior. Or if you only look at the user behavior, you don't necessarily see how that will manifest within the system. So the very first step is to at least map out the parts that enable us to understand what the user will see and experience. And, and this is all the users from your end client all the way to your staff. The second part is we try and do an idealized design after that. After we understand what is, now we start looking at what do we want to achieve in the new version of the system so that we avoid just doing the same thing we did before. It's absolutely crucial at this stage to already have an understanding about which parts of the software will be able to work together towards that solution. And often this, this is uh, one of the most crucial steps for some of the clients is to be able to get to this point where you can do an idealized design and you can make a decision with absolute confidence about what that software mix would look like. And you have less surprises by the time the development happens. A big part of the idealized design starts manifesting in things that are important to the development, such as the objects. Um, we, we often say that this phase of the, of, of the work is literally half of the development. 
after this phase, the development speeds up massively, specifically because you have such a higher understanding and you've already thought in terms of the objects. Then it's the traditional development. And again, we focus on far more declarative development and far more automation in Salesforce, specifically because we understand the client well enough. We always want to move it closer and closer to a position where a client can take responsibility for their own org, even in these complex scenarios. Then we have the initial implementation and go live. Again, this is absolutely crucial. We say that the most important part of a rocket, uh, if you look at something like the SpaceX rockets, is the launch itself. It only takes about two or three minutes to launch that rocket. It took two or three years before then to build, but you have to look at what the implementation looks like when it just starts. If we do a nine-month software development and we and we skimp what it looks like when we have to get this in front of users, that becomes crucial. One of the points that we try and keep in mind in this point is how important the understanding of the organizational culture is in order to pull this off successfully. And then fifth is ongoing operational involvement in the company and continuous enhancement. There's an important saying that good software is never done. It's only bad software that's ever done. You have to have the ability for the software to keep evolving as you evolve with new ideas, with continuous delivery. And we have a few specific principles that help us win with the blueprinting as well. The very, very first one is just clarity, clarity, clarity. There is no software simple enough that it can take away the fundamental complexity of your problem. We are in an age where everybody wants plug and play and where it becomes less and less possible for things to just work perfectly the way you want them to when you think of the entire system. So we admit and we acknowledge that we have to be able to think of how these systems tie together, how they all tie in, in a way that we can consistently understand. The second one is, is actually easy to illustrate. It's just the concept of Shannon's law losses. Um, Everybody knows the telephone game and how hilarious it is when you play it by the end that the message that you get at the end of how it started is completely different. This is no different in, in these projects. Every layer you add where information is transferred between one party and another causes some version of loss. So what we try and do is to keep it as close as possible to source. It's for that reason that we even bring our architects and our developers into the consulting sessions. We try and create a hive mind that understands as much as possible about what's going on in your business so that we can avoid the information losses that ultimately lead us to developing wrong solutions. Number three, we have to understand even the systems outside the one that we're working on. Again, if we think back of the systems theory, if I want a specific part to function well, I have to coordinate it with some of the other parts and I have to understand what the other parts do. Number four, we have to try and work within the client's culture. It's that old thing about culture, each strategy for breakfast. If, uh, and, and it's probably one of the reasons we, we, we like to send in experienced consultants that understand business, that understand how to function within these cultures. Uh, we try and spend as much as possible time with the client discussing the business problems, not just the software problems, so that we can ultimately build something that fits within that culture. And this broadly and fast is our, our fundamental approach to how we choose to approach these projects, how we choose to apply systems theory. It's something we, uh, we absolutely love um, and we'd like to take some questions on just how we've solved some of the problems before. Um, Lochner, I'll hand the mic back to you.